the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Hello, and welcome back to the mini series based on the memoirs of the court of Queen Elizabeth. Welcome to part three. In this episode, you'll learn about Elizabeth's succession issues, Mary Queen of Scots, and the trouble with Catherine Grey and the Earl of Hartford. Buckle up, because this is a fun one. The situation of Elizabeth, amid its many difficulties, presented none so perplexing, in which the opinions of her most prudent counselors were so much divided on the best mode of obviating, as those arising out of the doubt and confusion in which the right of succession was still involved. Her avowed repugnance to marriage, which was now feared to be insurmountable, kept the minds of men continually busy on this dangerous topic, and she was already incurring the blame of many by the backwardsness which she discovered in designating a successor and causing her choice to be confirmed, as it would readily have been by the Parliament. But this censure must be regarded as unjust. Even though the jealousy of power had found no entrance into the bosom of Elizabeth, sound policy required her long to deliberate before she formed a decision, and perhaps, whatever that decision might be, forbade her, under present circumstances, to announce it to the world. The title of the Queen of Scots, otherwise unquestionable, was barred by the will of Henry VIII, ratified by an unrepealed act of Parliament, and nothing less solemn than a fresh act of the whole legislature would have been sufficient to render it perfectly free from objection. And could Elizabeth be in reason expected to take such a step in behalf of a foreign and rival sovereign, professing a religion hostile to her own and that of her people, and one, above all, who had openly pretended a right to the crown preferable to her own? and who was even now exhausting the whole art and intrigue to undermine and supplant her. On the other hand, to confirm the exclusion of the Scottish line and adopt as her successor the representative of that of Suffolk appeared neither safe nor equitable. The testamentary disposition of Henry had evidently been dictated by caprice and resentment, and the title of Mary was nevertheless held sacred and indisputable, not only by all of the Catholics, but by the partisans of strict hereditary right in general, and by all who duly appreciated the benefits which must flow from a union of the English and Scottish scepters. To inflict a mortal injury on Mary might be as dangerous as to give her importance by an express law establishing her claims, and against any perils in which Elizabeth might thus involve herself the House of Suffolk could afford her no accession of strength, since their allegiance, all they had to offer, was hers already. The Lady Catherine Grey, the heiress of this house, might indeed have been united in marriage to some Protestant prince, whose power would have acted as a counterpoise to that of Scotland. But a secret and reluctant persuasion that the real right was with the Scottish line constantly operated on the mind of Elizabeth, so far as to prevent her from taking any step towards the advancement of the rival family. And the unfortunate Lady Catherine was doomed to undergo all the restraints, the persecutions, and the sufferings, which in that age formed the melancholy appendage of the younger branches of the royal race, with little participation of the homage or the hopes which some minds would have accepted as an adequate compensation. It will be remembered that the hand of this high-born lady was given to Lord Herbert, son of the Earl of Pembroke, on the same day that Guilford Dudley fatally received that of her elder sister, the Lady Jane, and that on the accession of Mary, this short-lived and perhaps uncompleted union had been dissolved at the instance of the politic father of Lord Herbert. From this time, Lady Catherine had remained in neglect and obscurity till the year 1560, when information of her having formed a private connection with the Earl of Hartford, son of the protector Somerset, 
reached the ears of Elizabeth. The lady, on being questioned, confessed her pregnancy, declaring herself at the same time to be the lawful wife of the earl. Her degree of relationship to the queen was not so near as to render her marriage without royal consent illegal. Yet, by a stretch of authority familiar to the Tudors, she was immediately sent prisoner to the tower. Harford, in the meantime, was summoned to produce evidence of the marriage. By a certain day, before special commissioners named by Her Majesty, from whose decision no appeal was to lie. He was at this time in France, and so, early a day, was designedly fixed for his answer, that he found it impractical to collect his proofs in time, and to the tower he also was committed, as the seducer of a maiden of royal blood. The child of which the Countess of Hartford was delivered soon after her committal was regarded as illegitimate, and she was doomed to expedite her pretended misconduct by a further imprisonment at the arbitrary pleasure of the queen. The birth of a second child, the fruit of stolen meetings between the captive pair, aggravated in the jealous eyes of Elizabeth their common guilt. The lieutenant of the tower, named Warner, lost his place for permitting or conniving at their interviews. Anne Hartford was sentenced in the Star Chamber to a fine of 15,000 pounds, for the double offense of vitiating a female of the royal blood and of breaking his prison to renew his offense. It might somewhat console this persecuted pair under all their sufferings to learn how unanimously the public voice was in their favor. No one doubted that they were lawfully married, a fact which was afterwards fully established, and it was asked by what right or on what principle her majesty presumed to keep asunder those whom God had joined. Words ran so high in this subject, after the sentence of the star chamber, that some alarmists in the privy chamber urged the necessity of inflicting still severer punishment on the earl, and of intimidating the talkers by strong measures. The further consequences of this affair to persons high in Her Majesty's confidence will be related hereafter. Meantime, it must be recorded, to the eternal disgrace of Elizabeth's character and government, that she barbarously and illegally detained her ill-fated kinswoman, first in the tower and afterwards in private custody, till the day of her death in January 1567, and that the earl, her husband, having added to the original offense of marrying a princess, the further presumption of placing upon legal record the proofs of his children's legitimacy, was punished, besides his fine, with an imprisonment of nine whole years. So much of the jealous spirit of her grandfather still survived in the bosom of this last of the Tudors. And that's where we'll end part three of this series. In part four, we'll continue on with Elizabeth's fascinating story through the eyes of Lucy Aiken and Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. Thank you so much for listening. If you love what you hear in this podcast, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Patrons receive commercial-free episodes, early releases, exclusive content, and more. Head over to patreon.com slash Dynasty to check out the options available. It's October, and that means holiday shopping season is either here or coming soon, depending on who you are. I've already purchased three gifts and have utterly shocked myself by doing so so early. Anyway... Did you know that I have a merchandise shop? I do. What you'll find there is all different kinds of Tudor and history designs. So stay tuned for some holiday discounts coming soon. You'll find a link to my shop in the show notes. 
This is the first opportunity that I have had to thank the patrons that I gained over the summer up until now. I'd like to give a big shout out to Lauren W., Jenny T., Florence T., Laura W., Karen B., Sabrina C., David P., Lana G., Ricky M., Mary Beth C., Athena C., Sarah Ann, Aaron, Aaron K., Olivia H., Loretta B., Lee W., Jody W., Susan W., K., Wanda P., and Andrea S. Thank you so much, you guys, for becoming patrons over my break or recently. I truly, seriously, sincerely thank you and appreciate your support.